Hi folks, and welcome to our introduction to Hito Steirl's essay, In Defense of the Poor Image, from 2009. It's a major work that's often taught in media studies courses. And Hito Steirl is a major figure, not only in media theory, but also, more importantly, in the art world. She's a German filmmaker, video artist, and theorist. Her artwork generally touches upon concepts related to media, technology, the circulation of images, especially things like militarization, surveillance, the role of media in globalization and late capitalism. As you'll see from the essay we're going to talk about in a bit, uh, her work and her writing is largely Marxist in orientation. Her artworks tend to mix fact and fiction, documentary footage and CGI. There's a kind of pop culture aesthetics and humor to her work as well. And once again, she's a prolific writer and theorist. She has a PhD in philosophy, and she's very much both in the world of media theory and in the world of contemporary moving image art, often in the form of video installations. So let's talk about that essay, In Defense of the Poor Image, from 2009. First, let's cover the basics. What is a poor image in Steirl's account? Well, I think you can get a pretty good definition of what she means by poor image in the first paragraph of the essay. And this is the paragraph. The poor image is a copy in motion. Its quality is bad. Its resolution substandard. As it accelerates, it deteriorates. It is a ghost of an image, a preview, a thumbnail, an errant idea, an itinerant image distributed for free, squeezed through slow digital connections, compressed, reproduced, ripped, remixed, as well as copied and pasted into other channels of distribution. So I think there's three central aspects of what makes a poor image a poor image on Steirl's account. And the first, most obviously, is visual degradation, right? She says, a poor image is of bad quality and its resolution is substandard. Kind of like the image you're seeing in the background right now, which I'll touch upon. Something that seems markedly digital, pixelized, and visually compressed through compression algorithms. But also a poor image, even more importantly, for Steirl, is massively circulated. Notice the references to circulation in this passage. She says it's a copy in motion. She says it accelerates. It's errant. It's itinerant. It's squeezed through slow digital connections. It's pasted into channels of distribution. So right off the bat, the poor visual quality is somehow related to the way in which poor images are circulated in digital networks. And that seems to be really important for Hito Steirl. Third is something slightly different from circulation, right? These images are not just circulated widely amongst digital networks but they are copied and compressed and remixed, right? And that capacity to copy and compress these images is a function of their digitality, that they are digital. And being copied over and over again is also what partly produces their poor visual quality. So what can we say as a kind of summary? Well, we can say that the essay investigates the political implications of poor images, images that are especially digital images degraded by repeated reproduction, compression, and massive circulation. And I think it's important to note that this essay was published on an online journal called Eflux in which Styrol was able to append images that are embedded into the article itself. One of those images is artist Thomas Ruff's JPEG RL104 from 2007. What the artist Thomas Ruff would do is he would blow up images that he got from the internet that were very small and compressed in terms of their data. And when he would blow them up, you would see the pixelation, the compression artifacts. So this is a good example of a poor image. Though ironically, of course, it's not a genuine poor image because it's been appropriated by an artist to comment upon the very nature of poor images. And another useful example of poor images that Steirl includes in her essay is this image of someone shoveling pirated DVDs in China. Pirated DVDs is a great example of poor images, often because those films are of poor quality, say they're produced by recording footage in a movie theater, and they also operate and circulate in different channels from mainstream cinematic distribution, right? These are pirated DVDs. They are not the DVDs produced by Hollywood studios. Okay, so now I wanna summarize some of the main arguments and trends of argument that you'll see in this essay. These are kind of answers to the question, what is the political value of the poor image. And mostly what this essay is, is articulating the value of poor images, because after all, it's entitled In Defense of the Poor Image. So the first value that we might ascribe to the poor image is through a social class analogy. And we can see this in the second paragraph of the essay. She writes, the poor image is a rag or a rip, an AVI or a JPEG, a lumpen proletarian in the class society of appearances ranked and valued according to its resolution. So immediately we start to get an analogy posed between the poorness of poor images 
and social groups relegated to the bottom of political hierarchies. And immediately she's adopting the language of Marxist theory, right? She compares poor images to the lumpen proletariat. And here it becomes clear that there's a double valence to that word poor and poor images. Steirl will use the words poor image and rich image and want the reader to understand a double valence. That poor also refers to an economic poor, a financial poor. Number two, another major political value of poor images is that it democratizes access. So she'll say, it transforms quality into accessibility. The image is liberated from the faults of cinemas and archives and thrust into digital uncertainty. So immediately we're getting this idea that not only is there a kind of symbolic value to the poor image in terms of the analogy to social groups, but more literally and practically, poor images are more easily accessible, especially in compared to images, say, rare films that are kept in archives of museums. And the third thing that I want to highlight in the second paragraph of the essay are explicit references to Walter Benjamin's work of art essay. When she says exhibition value into cult value and contemplation into distraction, those are pretty explicit references to this landmark work in the history of media theory. Walter Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Its Technological Reproducibility, written in 1935. Walter Benjamin was a major critic and film theorist associated with the Frankfurt School, an intellectual movement that started in the early 20th century in Germany that was largely Marxist in orientation and turned its attention toward culture and cultural objects, including film. So the essay is about technological reproducibility. And to put that in plain terms, it's about what happened to the history of art when we were starting to be able to copy artworks with photographic reproduction. What happens, Benjamin asks, when I can take a original work of art, say the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci, and produce millions of copies of it by photographing it and reproducing it and putting it in spots throughout the world? And the second question is, what do the art forms of photography and especially cinema, which is based on photography in terms of its medium, what does it mean that those art forms don't have originals in the way that paintings do? And what political value might we have in an art form that exists only as copies? So one tentative answer that Benjamin gives is located in a sentence like this. He'll say, for the first time in world history, technological reproducibility emancipates the work of art from its parasitic subservience to ritual. So while Benjamin is sympathetic to the kind of feelings that can arise from standing in front of an original artwork, say original paintings, and feeling that sense of presence that only comes from standing in front of the original, he'll call that sense of presence the aura. The essay is largely trying to understand the political potential, the progressive potential, of getting away from a fetishization of the aura. Think about it this way. Benjamin shows us that the development of photography allowed us to move from a less democratized to a more democratized ability to encounter artworks. He reminds us that even the development of museums that would house famous paintings is itself a fairly recent development in the history of our appreciation and encounters with art. Before the Mona Lisa was inducted into the Louvre Museum in 1797, it was protected under King Francis I. It wasn't for everyone. And just as museums moved paintings from a private space only for the cultural and social elite, mechanical reproduction or technological reproducibility allowed for a further democratization of art, a further increase in accessibility. And Benjamin is excited about film as a medium because, as he says, film is the first art form whose artistic character is entirely determined by its reproducibility. He continues, As soon as the criterion of authenticity ceases to be applied to artistic production, the whole social function of art is revolutionized. Instead of being founded on ritual, it is based on a different practice, politics. So Benjamin was very skeptical of placing value in originals, value in authentic original works. And in a very similar way, Hido Steirl is interested in the possibility of poor images liberating art forms, especially, say, marginalized or non-narrative or experimental artworks, from their confinement to the cultural elite. She says, the image is liberated from the vaults of cinemas and archives and thrust into digital uncertainty. So we can see a parallel between Benjamin's interest in the increasing democratization of art with the birth of photography and Steirl's interest in liberating moving image art from museum archives to pirated copies that circulate more freely in digital networks. 
So let's give a deeper dive into that idea of democratization. Where does that idea come up other than the second paragraph of the essay? So Shiro will say, in the class society of images, cinema takes on the role of a flagship store. In flagship stores, high-end products are marketed in an upscale environment. More affordable derivatives of the same images circulate as DVDs on broadcast television or online as poor images. So it's important for Shiro to note the affordability of poor images with respect to the more expensive counterparts in cinemas. And she'll explain a little bit historically why poor images emerged. And it has to do with the decrease in funding of alternative moving image forms. She'll say, 20 or even 30 years ago, the neoliberal structuring of media production began slowly obscuring non-commercial imagery to the point where experimental and essayistic cinema became almost invisible. Resistant or non-conformist visual matter disappeared from the surface into an underground of alternative archives and collections kept alive only by a network of committed organizations and individuals who would circulate bootlegged VHS copies amongst themselves. With the possibility to stream video online nowadays, this condition started to dramatically change. What else is the value of poor images? Well, she seems to celebrate them because they are posed against an aesthetic hierarchy. You might say poor images undermine the conservative fetishization of tradition, beauty, and authenticity. So check out this passage. She says, The insistence upon analog film as the sole medium of visual importance resounded throughout discourses on cinema. It never mattered that these high-end economies of film production were, and still are, firmly anchored in systems of national culture, capitalist studio production, the cult of mostly male genius, and the original version, and thus are often conservative in their very structure. The rich image established its own set of hierarchies. So here you might think of film culture, especially cinephilic film culture, in which the value of, say, 35 millimeter film is posed against the digital. You're, you're not too sure about the digital era, no, the I, widescreen and so on. The digital era... At least it, it does nothing for me. <laughs> it does nothing for me. I mean, I actually think I'm getting gypped when I go to a movie and I realize it's either been shot on digital or being projected in digital. Right, she wants us to question the motivations for this knee-jerk valuation of 35 millimeter film, or even of high-res digital. She wants us to ask ourselves, why are these things valued? Is it because we want to maintain the tradition of using film in the face of the digital revolution? Well, that's a kind of traditionalism, a sense of maintaining what is traditional for no other reason than to maintain what is traditional and could be called conservative in its very orientation. And also consider just how much more expensive shooting on film is than shooting on digital. One previous text that she draws on in order to kind of make this point about going against aesthetic hierarchies is the third cinema manifesto for an imperfect cinema. She writes, the emergence of poor images reminds one of a classic third cinema manifesto for an imperfect cinema by Julio Garcia Espinosa, written in Cuba in the late 1960s. Espinosa argues for an imperfect cinema because in his words, quote, perfect cinema, technically and artistically masterful, is almost always reactionary cinema. So here she's drawing on this manifesto that was making similar claims about the fetishization of technical mastery and conventional beauty. And that these fetishizations of technical mastery and, and conventional beauty are not value or ideologically neutral. They're bound up with a capitalist mode of production of Hollywood cinema. And the third major argument that might be understood to say, show us the value of poor images, is this idea of circulation and movement. She argues that the poorness of poor images actually indexes their circulation. So she says, their situation, that is poor images situation, reveals much more than the content or appearance of the images themselves. It also reveals the conditions of their marginalization, the constellation of social forces leading to their online circulation as poor images. Poor images are poor because they are not assigned any value within the class society of images. Their status as illicit or degraded grants them exemption from its criteria. Their lack of resolution attests to their appropriation and displacement. So this is an important new argument because she's not just saying that the poorness of poor images asserts itself against the dominance of beautiful or crisp or high res images, which are associated with studio systems and capitalism, but also poor images become poor partly through the way that they circulate and are copied and reproduced. Quite literally, poor images become more poor when they are copied over and over again because the compression algorithms that allow for digital copying lead to degradation. 
And she creates the impression that this index of circulation and movement is kind of a good thing because it is the circulation of poor images that encapsulates their freedom from a hierarchical chain of distribution, right? She sees the circulation of poor images as almost the masses asserting their own autonomy. They're sharing the images with each other. They are not passively accepting what a large capitalist institution of Hollywood movie production is going to give them. And this brings me to a strain of argumentation that emerges in the last three pages in which we might ask, wait a minute, are poor images a purely good thing? And I think Shiral's answer might be yes and no. I want us to see their value in a society that devalues them. That's certainly the main point of the paper. But I also want to acknowledge the conditions, i.e. capitalism, that led to our reliance on them, and also acknowledge that digital networks are not utopias of free exchange. And she encapsulates this ambivalence about poor images beautifully in this single sentence. The circulation of poor images feeds into both capitalist media assembly lines and alternative audiovisual economies. And here, once again, this ambivalence or this kind of almost paradoxical nature of poor images should remind us of a similar argumentative ten tendency in Walter Benjamin's work of art essay. He says, throughout the workday in offices and factories, city dwellers have to relinquish their humanity in the face of an apparatus. In the evening, these same masses fill the cinemas to witness the film actor taking revenge on their behalf, not only by asserting his humanity against the apparatus, but by placing that apparatus in the service of his triumph. So Benjamin will very much acknowledge that the same technologies that liberate artworks from their being enshrined and restricted to the cultural elite are also part of a technological revolution that perpetuates a capitalist mode of production. There is a structural similarity between the assembly line, which copies and reproduces objects for mass consumption and photographic reproduction. And this is not a mistake of the argument. This is actually embedded in the fundamental principles of Marxism. The idea that capitalism itself will produce the very conditions that lead to the overthrow of capitalism. And this is exactly how Benjamin starts his essay. So Steyrol will elaborate on this fundamental ambivalence in a couple key passages. She'll say, on the one hand, the poor image operates against the fetish value of high resolution. That's the clear part of the defense of the poor image. On the other hand, though, this is precisely why it also ends up being perfectly integrated into an information capitalism thriving on compressed attention spans, on impression rather than immersion, on intensity rather than contemplation, on previews rather than screenings. So what Steyrel is doing here is partly acknowledging that digital networks, which is the place in which poor images circulate, are also the location of capitalist exchange. And this would become even more true in 2022 than it was in 2009. Steyrel is not necessarily advocating for the ways in which social media platforms will commodify our information and will turn everybody into a performer, right? That we will commodify our own lives through the willful performance of our social media accounts. She continues a similar line of thinking here. The circulation of poor images creates visual bonds, as Giga Vertov once called them. This visual bond was, according to Vertov, supposed to link the workers of the world with each other. He imagined a sort of communist visual Adamic language that could not only inform or entertain, but also organize its viewers. In a sense, his dream has come true, if mostly under the rule of a global information capitalism whose audiences are linked almost in a physical sense by mutual excitement, affective attunement, and anxiety. There's that similar rhetorical structure. Poor images and how they circulate do remind us of these wonderful things, but we have to remember that those wonderful things are also attached to global capitalism. So how, so how does Shiral end her essay? Because in the last few pages, she does this back and forth, always acknowledging the limitations of the things that she seems to be celebrating. Well, a lot like Walter Benjamin, she seems to end on the side of asserting the value of defending the poor image. Right? You might say, don't forget my title. This is largely a defense of the poor image. And so I'll just leave you with the final passage or a little excerpt from the final passage of her essay. She writes, one could of course argue that the poor image is not the real thing, but then please anybody show me this real thing. The poor image is no longer about the real thing, the originary original. Instead, it is about its own real conditions of existence, about swarm circulation, digital dispersion. In short, it is about reality. So she ends on this affirmative note. 
And her argumentation in this last passage is very Benjaminian in the sense that it is about dispelling that valuation of the original in the face of the copy. She thinks that tendency to value originals, to value the quote unquote authentic, is a dangerous one, right? She says, if you are faced with a poor image copy of a particular film, an important artwork, and you say, this is not the real thing, show me the real thing, she wants to say, what do you mean by real? And are you prepared to articulate the reasoning behind valuing the quote unquote original or real? And she seems to mostly celebrate the idea that the poor image visually acknowledges the fact that it is not the original through its visual degradation. Instead, its visual degradation gives us a sign, a signifier of how it circulates, of how it is dispersed, of how it is shared by others, of how it is communicated across a digital network of people who want to maintain its existence. And she calls that activity, that informational exchange, reality. Not the reality of the original artwork, but the reality of social activity. Okay, and that about does it for our introductory review of Hido Steirl's In Defense of the Poor Image. And I'll see you next time.